Yeah. I'm gonna pull it. The lapel mic. In any case, this session is streaming. I will come back to my keynote shortly. I'm just going to check out our next door. Okay. Now, if I wanted to fix it, uh, uh, I believe I just did. Okay. So, this microphone is live. Okay. Yes. All right, so we're getting so are we getting all of our logistics organized here? I think we're all, all squared away. So this is our the second. <laughs> There's a strange buzzing sound over there. So this is the second of our ontology track. Uh, talks. This is uh, my colleague Elisa Kendall from Mathematics, and she's going to be talking about libraries and managing libraries of ontologies for reuse. And we've, this is a theme that's come up in a few of the talks in the last uh, day and a half. And she's going to do a, a I think we say, I'm expecting a pretty deep dive. I actually have not reviewed her slides. I'm sorry, Elisa, but I, I know which thing you're going to talk about anyway. I'm expecting a pretty deep dive into um, how you can organize these things, how standards organizations are working with them, especially the OMG. And uh, well, I'll just turn it over to Elisa. Very good. Thanks, Dean. And good morning, everyone. So um, as you mentioned, um, one of the things that is really important to me is standardization. And in fact, the challenge, and even Aura mentioned this this morning in his keynote, one of the challenges is, you know, who are you standardizing for? Who's your audience? How do you determine what needs to go in a reusable library? And uh, how do you then get it out there and promote it? And so um, just to get started, a little bit of background. A lot of you know something about the Financial Industry Business Ontology, or FIBO. Um, it is an industry-level ontology. Um, it's one of few in the financial domain that's actually a, a, a standard, although there are a number of them in bioinformatics and elsewhere. Um, and so FIBO's um, real mission is to help people standardize information for securities master data management, for regulatory reporting, and then a lot of other features around that. And it was um, work started um, in the mid 2000s, uh, sort of in response to the crisis um, in the EU and in the US and in response to some of the regulations that came out after that. Um, Mike Bennett, uh, Mike Atkin, both of whom have spoken here at the conference and um, a few other data management professionals like David Newman from Wells Fargo got together and um, did a tremendous amount of work to sort of set the stage and to start to seed FIBO as early as, you know, 2008, 2009. Um, it was originally a UML model. It was transformed to OWL in 2013. But what was lacking were a lot of processes um, that could be put in place to improve it and to simplify in some ways. And then beyond that, in order to allow it to be released as a standard, that happened as a joint release between the Object Management Group and EDM Council in 2015, um, which seems like it was yesterday, and yet it was quite a, a while ago in in uh, web time. So, um, what we have done is put an entire infrastructure in place for um, working towards a higher and higher levels of quality for at least some what I would describe as unit level testing. Um, both in terms of the uh, syntax and metadata in the models, as well as with respect to some lightweight semantic issues. The ontologies that are uh, associated with FIBO are freely available in GitHub um, at the link on the screen. And we're working to establish a new baseline for um, an updated publication at the OMG. Um, one of the reasons that this is uh, something that's close to my heart is that we've discovered the more and more that we've been working through FIBO development, the more and more important having 
a set of patterns that are repeated throughout this ontology that people can understand, recognize, and reuse um, are a piece of our story. And so in order to really make um, a lot of the relationships in particular in FIBO cleaner and to eliminate various duplication across the ontology, given that it has probably close to 2000 classes, um, almost as many properties and over, well, close to 20,000 instances in terms of reference data, all of which is available at that GitHub site. Um, it's really, really hard for people to jump into it. And so what we're really trying to do is to find entry points, including patterns that allow people to come up to speed more quickly, that allow more and more people to contribute and to, you know, use those patterns to stamp out new pieces of the ontology. Um, we haven't seen as much of that happen as we had hoped when we released it to GitHub a couple of years back. But increasing focus on the patterns will make that more doable. And so one of the things that we've learned is that those same patterns are not unique to finance. Most of the ones that we're talking about are patterns with respect to how to represent things like codes and code sets, which are a huge deal in healthcare, bioinformatics, but also in agriculture, also in engineering. So there are a lot of domains where these same patterns apply. And so our idea was, well, maybe we can take these core patterns and release them in a library at OMG that's also open source, but cleaned up so it's not quite as FIBO specific and enable other users to pick those up and reuse them. And so that's really what I'm talking about today. I'll focus on some of the patterns and also on the next steps in order for publication purposes, how we're gonna get those out there and then uh, invite you all to keep an eye out and to look for them and then play with them and send us feedback uh, once they're out there. So at the OMG, there is uh, an emerging standard, and I, I believe Pete Rivet, who's following me, will talk more about some of this, um, which is designed specifically to help modelers, those using UML and other modeling tools like uh, SysML that the UML community promotes or for systems engineering or BPMN for business process modeling. Um, a lot of those standards need the ability for their users to represent the same model with different language or nomenclature applied to it. So whether that's natural language, because you happen to be living in um, France and you'd like to work in French instead of in English, or if you're in Japan or China, where not only is the, lang the natural language difference, but the way that it's rendered is quite different. The tools themselves have been internationalized, but that doesn't mean that the models are. And so to ensure that people can see the model in their own language or nomenclature, which differs from uh, domain area to domain area, um, MVF, which is uh, on its way towards standardization, is supposed to help people do that. It connects the model elements in, say, a systems engineering model to an ontology which provides the vocabulary for that model so that you can switch vocabularies as needed depending on where in the world you're located and the specific nomenclature that is important to you. So some of the key requirements had to do with representing the relationships between the ontology elements and the corresponding model elements, being able to select terms from a vocabulary specific to your domain area, and to add reference data and other things to those vocabulary elements so that you could share them and understand what something meant. A way to import and export the vocabularies you're working with out of the UML tools, and how to make sure that we could support this in any UML modeling environment or other um, OMG metadata um, object facility um, standard-based models. So there are lots and lots of them across domains in aerospace, in um, manufacturing, in systems engineering, 
um, on the business side in our new BPM plus health community. So the applications are tremendous and this capability is sorely needed and has been a huge gap at OMG for many years. As a part of that effort, we're including sort of a companion specification for this set of what I'll describe as little common pattern ontologies that are based in part on ISO 1087, which is a vocabulary representation standard from the ISO community, and on ISO 11179, which is a metadata standard also from the ISO community. And as I mentioned, these patterns are needed across lots of different um, standards at OMG, but also outside of the OMG. So there are things going on with respect to retail, a new retail industry ontology based on the retail reference data model that was originally developed in the US and actually worldwide through the National uh, Retail Foundation. That group is now part of OMG and they're working on um, updating their reference data model to become a real industry standard ontology like FIBO. Um, another one is in the robotics area. We have robotics guys working on a, an ontology for service robots. Uh, which they're doing in conjunction with the robotics work at IEEE. And so this library would be things that any of these um, opportunities could leverage, but we're also testing it for use in a couple of other activities that I've been involved in and that um, Dean and Pete and others are aware of. One of them um, is the Industrial Ontology Foundry, and another is an IDMP-associated effort in the pharmaceutical world, um, IDMP stands for uh, Identification of Medicinal Products, and there are a series of ISO standards there that a lot of the practitioners in the pharmaceutical industry and regulators, such as the FDA, have recognized <laughs> that the um, standard doesn't go far enough for matching the semantics of a gazillion pharmaceutical substances and products uh, requires. So we're working to use these same patterns on uh, those efforts, um, giving them a little more weight and a little more confidence across domain areas that when we publish them at the OMG, they actually will have been well tested uh, across domains. So the library itself, the early version of the library is mainly um, what I would describe as simple patterns. Um, simple in terms of the small ontologies, not necessarily so simple in the kinds of um, effects that you can get from them and in terms of the capabilities that you could get through reasoning over them um, across silos and across uh, standards as it happens. So one of the hard things that, that people um, need to be able to do, especially across corporations and uh, in an industry um, common library in particular is how to assign names to things. And names actually have a lot of metadata associated with them. They change over time. There may be variations on a theme depending on the domain aspect that you're, you're coming from. So, so that's really an important piece. Um, another one is how to identify things. And it turns out that a lot of people just use strings, as, as some of you might imagine, for identifiers, which is not enough to say, OK, when was this identifier validated? By whom? Who's the registration authority? Where is it managed? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and related to identifiers, also codes and relating codes and code sets to things. There are a gazillion codes out there. Um, examples include codes for um, countries and languages that everybody's familiar with, but maybe less familiar with all of the codes assigned to medicinal products and substances. And you really want your practitioners who are taking care of you in a hospital to use precisely the substance that you're not allergic to and the medicinal product that does not include the substance that you are allergic to. And the codes that identify these things are arcane and they are not well mapped to one another. And so just fixing that alone is a huge win uh, for all of us um, internationally, since the group that's working on this is, in fact, an international working group. And then classifying things. Um, asset classes for financial instruments. Almost every bank has their own. 
Um, there are a couple that the regulators use, but it's not consistent across um, organizations at all. And, you know, similar kinds of classification schemes for uh, other domains also need these same patterns. So here's kind of an example, just for a name of a human being. Um, in databases, we find frequently that, you know, sort of legacy data includes a lot of name elements that are in fact um, not necessarily useful depending on where you live or where you grew up or, or how your name is constructed um, and whether or not it includes the, the surnames of both of your parents, um, Italy just approved doing that in fact, or one of your parents or how to order it or um, in what context do you use that name? And then when you start adding things like digital identity, to the information that your bank needs to know about you, but needs to protect from a privacy perspective, having all of the metadata about your name, including um, what context you use it in, uh, when it was last validated, and what the protections around it need to be, um, is, is very important. And so this pattern that we use has um, the name, but also typically the name points to an identifier for you, uh, not the other way around. And then you can infer or use Sparkle inverse queries to find all of the names that, that one has for you. <coughs> Similar with identifiers, it's the same pattern. Um, although some structured identifiers are actually composites, they might include uh, country codes, um, they might include other embedded codes. Um, there are needs for patterns and for structured identifiers for things like legal entity identifiers for counterparties and securities, for products and agriculture, uh, again, for identifying medicinal products. Um, many of them are registered with a registration authority and they're minted according to some identification scheme. And so here's an example. This is a, a legal entity identifier for Citibank um, in the Glyph uh, registry, the Global LEI Foundation's registry. The search for these identifiers is powered by ontologies derived from FIBO, but enhanced and updated to support the Global LEI Foundation process, which um, actually Pete has been heavily involved in. And already there's data for over 2 million records um, about these LEIs in data.world. And I have other examples here, but I think I'm gonna skip forward uh, quickly so that we can take a few questions about the timing of the publication of the library and um, what exactly will be there. So there are uh, other simple patterns we're promoting in the library for an annotation uh, ontology that we've used across several of these projects, collections, something that that expressly uh, includes a date and a date period mapped to the owl time uh, for business users and a text data type that allows us to combine plain and language tag strings. Um, there are some more complicated patterns that we are hoping to promote over time. Um, one for registration authorities for registering identifiers um, and up Dated quantities and units ontology that can map to multiple units ontologies that people use, but that also is useful for OMG for the emerging system LV2 project um, mm -hmm. that was developed in association with the NIST um, parties and the roles that they play, and then some situated uh, what I'll call reified relationships that links parties to situations that they are in that are time bound with a lot of property chains to link things together in a gazillion different ways for use in a, a in a rich knowledge graph and possibly schedules for complex payment schedules and um, for calendaring and things like that. So we'll see how many of these get in in what time frame, but um, certainly the simpler patterns will be in our initial library. And I've added some slides here that um, Actually, Dean and I built together for an earlier um, presentation, and I'm going to skip through those because, um, except to the end. So, so this is an example of that, uh, the situational pattern 
that we use to determine who owns what. And for um, beneficial ownership for securities, um, it's even more difficult to determine because often the, the security is held in the name of the custodian. So suppose you have a 401k with um, Fidelity or Northwest Mutual or someone else in another part of the world with your bank in Denmark or something, then sometimes the security is actually in the name of the, the broker or custodian. And so then you need to understand what the relationship between that so-called owner and the true beneficial owner is to understand how to roll up a risk. And so this pattern actually includes some of the chained properties that allow you to reconcile that. And uh, we've tested it with 5 million records of data at one of the largest banks in the US um, successfully. Um, and I'm working towards uh, another project, which will do the same thing in another domain area so that we have uh, a lot of confidence that this pattern holds fairly broadly. Um, and so uh, ownership is complicated and there's a lot of evidence that goes with it. And being able to link that evidence to the relationship in sort of a reified relationship I'll call ownership is critical for getting this right and for doing regulatory re uh, reporting around it correctly. And so um, the slides here in the deck show you how we build those patterns up to get to ownership. Um, and I'll leave that for an exercise to uh, the reader. But if you're interested in more about this, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, so next steps are all around figuring out how to publish the library at OMG. So the initial library will include this set of smaller ontologies I've listed here. Um, it will be included as a companion specification to the multiple vocabulary facility uh, RFP, which is um, planned for publication at the OMG uh, in about two weeks. So uh, in advance of our June meeting, the um, OMG has a four week rule where we publish everything in advance so that people can review it and decide how they're gonna vote on it or what updates need to be made to it before they'll um, vote for publication. So that step is on its way. The remaining gap right now for uh, MVF is an early API and Mayo Clinic and Raytheon are actually developing that like crazy people as we speak. So um, we'll include the initial version of the API and the standard in addition to the ontologies and meta model that go with it. And we're planning to submit it uh, for the June meeting, which means May 23rd, we have to post it to the OMG server and it will be posted uh, ultimately later this year once it's approved by the OMG at the links at the bottom of the page that you see here. There's also an associated GitHub, but it's only accessible to OMG members. So um, I can actually share some of the Commons ontologies with folks uh, if they would like to take a look at them in advance of publication. Um, just reach out to me and let me know. And then the other thing that I'm hoping to get from this community is we're looking towards how to build out and publish something like the catalog that um, the BioPortal and OBO Foundry and other um, working groups that have catalogs of ontologies publish. Our catalog, our specification catalog at OMG is uh, more relationally oriented, although it does already include RDF markup for all of our standards, um, which has helped tr uh, tremendously in terms of people finding them. But I'm also looking for um, suggestions from the community on how to move the OMG catalog forward and how we should publish these cataloged ontologies aside from sharing them with Dean for publication on data.world, for example, um, so that people can find them and reuse them. And so there you go. Questions for me. Well, well, well done, Elisa, to hit exactly the minus five minute mark. Let's give Elisa a hand. I'm not surprised that I'm seeing hands come up for questions already. So this is fell in the front row.
Uh, hi, Lisa. I always get a lot out of your talks. I'm glad that you're here. Um, I saw that you put, you know, units of measurement and everything. I'm very glad to see that that's going to be in the patterns. Uh, another thing, though, I'm curious if if there's a timeline for things like, you know, FIBO has performance indicators and all sorts of things. There's time series everywhere in, in the financial market, key performance indicators, um, those type of things. Is, is there a plan for data cubes and time series representations, you know, to, to join external ontologies on that front? So um, what happens is that we have um, challenges with just getting to the point where we can publish these simple things, um, getting agreement and, and real testing around time series data is harder. We do have work we're doing with the Bureau of Labor Statistics and um, other folks like them, Census Bureau in the US, Statistics Canada in Canada, um, and, and again in the pharma industry, um, we're working with other industry, EMA, which is the European um, regulator for medicinal products, I mean, where we could use time series data, but I think it takes a lot more data to test and more people to be confident before you would publish a model for that per se in your um, set of standards. We have some pieces of that in FIBO, as you said, but, um, and they correspond to some work that has been done at uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics on um, economic indicators, among other things. But before we would publish that as a pattern, I think we need to, you know, walk before we run and, and also get input and testing from the community so that we are sure that the work that we've done so far works for people. And then if we extend it with things like that, using um, some, maybe some of the work done at the DDI Alliance and other places, uh, plus what we've done in FIBO, then we have more confidence about standardization, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions in the room? Yeah. There's also a question online, I think it's quite interesting as well, which we'll get to. Yeah, we're just wondering, uh, with respect to what used to be known as software patterns and the way they were formulated in terms of problem, context of applicability, and, and yeah, I mean, have you given any thought in, in uh, uh, describing uh, these patterns in, in similar fashion that kind of helps uh, figure out what their applicability is? Yeah, absolutely. So none of the work that we've done has been done in a vacuum. Um, all these patterns are part of use uh, a number of use cases. Um, MVF itself reuses the patterns that are in the common library. Also, our languages, countries, and codes ontology at the OMG will be republished using these same identifiers and code on um, relationships that are in the, the commons library. And for the pharmaceutical industry, for example, we have use cases for matching codes and code sets and identifiers across the world for the same uh, chemical product. Uh, Matthias spoke on Monday in the healthcare workshop a little bit about that work. And so I think um, we have use cases for the ones that we're standardizing absolutely and competency questions that we need to be able to answer with respect to mapping uh, identifiers across various uh, silos. But um, we have not yet published all of those use cases and some of them um, are still sort of nascent, like the, the pharmaceutical product one is still in work. And so I can't really publish that until we're ready to do so. But, but yes, all of these are driven by uh, competency questions, being able to answer those questions. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to provide at least some of those examples in the ontology standard itself as we finalize it at the OMG so people can see how to use those things. All right, so I was really hoping to get to the question that's online here about the possibilities of using GitHub and following some of the patterns that Oboe Foundry does, but uh, we're actually right at the end of our next uh, talk, so that's a discussion we'll have to have offline. So thank you so much, Elisa, and thank you, everybody, for uh, coming to Thank you for having me.